Welcome, 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 lovely people. If you hear an accent, yes, I'm Jamaican and I'm actually enjoying using the accent more often. So if you can't understand, you might have to search a new dictionary. Um, welcome. I must start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge the sacred land where we work, create, and find breath. And this land has been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years. And it's the land on which I danced, administer, and support the arts. This land is a traditional territory, Takaranto, where the trees meet the water, the gathering place of many nations, the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the uh, Credit First Nation. We're grateful and thankful to have the opportunity to live, work, and play on this land. In extension, I want to call into focus and honor the indigenous lands of the Americas and the Caribbean, in particular, that of the Tainos, the land from which I grew and was nurtured at birth, that land, Jamaica, the land of wood and water, known to you as Jamaica. As we acknowledge systems of oppression on this land, and in particular, anti-Black racism, and a whole bunch of under-resourcing that goes to APOC artists and professionals in particular, I'm mindful of the indigenous teachings and philosophies like the wampum belt and the dish with one spoon, aimed at bringing us through diverse understandings into a shared collective presence and opportunity. And with that opportunity, I wanna invite both Bridget and Fanny to join me. Excellent, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is part of a larger state of emergence project. Uh, it is a partnership with uh, Mass Culture, which is providing a lot of research support, Art of Festivals, of which my colleague Fanny Martin and I um, are creative uh, producing, and Sapamo, which is just providing such a strong and engaged network as we explore uh, this topic and many other topics that are related to emergence. So this project was conceived in the darkest hours of the lockdown. It was in the winter time and it was in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And we were really trying to think beyond the sense of emergency and think about emergence and think about the light of a new dawn and recognizing that we weren't going to return to what we knew before. It was going to be a new normal. We wanted to take advantage of some of the digital strategy funding that was available from the Canada Council. It was an opportunity for us to be very iterative and experiment and to experiment with different ways of, of thinking and proceeding on a creative journey. We didn't need to have everything figured out in advance and that completely suits the, suits the purpose of this project just fine. One of our leading principles with the State of Emergence Project and working with Sapamo and with Mass Culture is to explore how we can have better and deeper conversations amongst one another, especially in this virtual setting. We're really interested in sharing and documenting how conversations such as the one we're going to have today uh, do not end just when we hit leave meeting, but how they can continue to um, fire and enrich other continuing conversations. So I'll hand it over to my colleague Fanny to speak a bit more about the future of State of Emergence. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, we have been partnering with Pamo and with Culture Shift as well, and with lots of individuals we've been in conversation with. And one thing that we're already learning really very much in our bodies is that change happens at the pace of trust. So to make the change that we want to see happen, we also need to build that trust and to be very intentional about it. And building this trust within and outside, uh, beyond our existing circles. And if you are here today, we're all together, we already have something in common. Uh, we have this desire for change and for centering artists uh, in, the, in the art ecology, uh, that's already a commonality that we can build from. So we can be here in confidence that we are, we are here to, uh, to find this point of emergence and to, to work towards it. Um, something that we came across as well in our research and it might seem obvious to you, it seems obvious to me now, I only came across uh, Adrienne Marie Brown uh, halfway uh, through the research. She's a fantastic facilitator who wrote a book called Emergent Strategies. And she talks about working inch wide. Uh, yes, thank you, Kevin, it's also there. Uh, it's fantastic. And you know, this is something that we could uh, do so much about uh, as well, like 
But uh, yeah, I want to bring her uh, principle and it's not just hers and she's so good about uh, acknowledging all the learnings that she uh, gained from conversations and um, you know, events like this. Uh, but she talks about working inch wide, mile deep. And this is what we can do together. We can be very intentional and we can practice trust and dialogue. And I pass on over to Kevin to continue uh, this, this party. Thank you, Fanny, and thank you, Bridget. Yes, and in this trust and dialogue, this is a three, we're in the middle of what is a three-part session. Um, the first session happened during the Gathering um, Divergence Multi-Arts um, multi Festival and Conference, which we started talking about the art, the ecology and the, and, the, and the arts itself and how artists are existing in it. We had uh, Shannon Litzenberger, who was a moderator there, myself, uh, Renata, Renata Sautier from Propella Dance, and Cynthia Likudstead had a conversation We've been documenting that conversation as well, leading to this one. We will end the series with a conversation that will be in partnership with Impact Festival, and it'll be around rethinking the application process. In what ways we could gather information from the three sessions that will look at what are some of the challenges that may exist in the application process, or that we hear from now this idea of centering artists um, in the arts ecology at the center rather than funding. I think you've seen the set of questions and we must acknowledge that funding has been very much at the center rather than the needs of the artists. And so it's actually not necessarily working for the benefit of those which we seek to fund and support. With that, I want to, it's a pleasure to introduce Ella as our facilitator and I'm gonna just throw it over to Ella. Hi everybody. Um... I, I literally had a skip in my step this morning to be part of this gathering. And I look forward to the day that we can all be in the same space together. I think some of you are starting to feel that energy of people again, and, uh, and it, it makes such a huge difference. Um, but I wanna recognize that this community has, has, well, the work that you're doing, I know a lot of folks who are in the, on the list here, and some of you I know of your work, you are already making change. You are already making strides. So I want to first thank you for showing up today. Um, I'm always impressed because Zoom fatigue is real and we're going to do our best to keep it lively, um, to keep you engaged. And we're also trying um, to create a kind of safe space as well. Um, and, I, and within that, what that looks like on this journey that we're on is we'll have a little bit of a warm up slash check-in we're going to be hearing from uh, um, a array of speakers, but we won't listen to them all in a line. We're gonna to listen to one and ask questions and then go out into a breakout session and then come back, meet another speaker. And so in a way they're like a catalyst for conversation. And I think this goes without saying, having chatted with Sapamo, that it's really important that we, we hear from you as well. This is a conversation. Um, and in order to create a space that's welcoming for all, I have just some suggestions on ways that we can hold space together and I'm going to copy it into the chat as well. Oh, and someone put up my bio, nice. Um, oops, let's just make sure this goes to everyone and not one person. Okay, so I will welcome you in this time together. It didn't go. Okay, come on, you know you want to. All right, so I invite you in this space to participate fully in ways that work for you. So participating fully looks different for everyone. Um, but if you're here, please go beyond just being a passive listener, if that's comfortable for you today. Please in this time, ask for what you need. So there'll be times your video is off, we can't see you, you're taking care of yourself, great. But there'll be moments but where you wanna hear more about something specific. I read through all the reasons why folks are here today. So please make sure that this time is also fruitful for you and ask for what you need. Um, another little one is around no put downs of self or others. We are all incredible magical beings. Please, you know, if you're walking, if you're, if you're showing yourself, if you're speaking, um, we want to hear you. Don't put yourself down. We're all coming from different levels of experience, cultural backgrounds, creativity, everything. Um, please big yourself up and the folks around you. And then lastly, um, please don't forget to breathe. Take the time to breathe. Take the time to feel your feet on the ground, be in a full embodied being in this Zoom call. But also, if you need to doodle, knit, stand up, stretch, please do all those things. Don't try to maintain this funny, you know, medium close up the whole time if there's different ways that you want to be embodied in this experience. 
So those are, um, are the, the sort of safe space agreements that we're holding today. And if anything else comes up for you, please feel free to add it to the chat. Um, and for everyone who's here on the call, I was really, we'll be asking this to the, to the speakers themselves to start off their sessions and share this. But for all of us, we won't be able to hear all of each other's voices. I want to invite you now either to write this on a physical piece of paper or to put it in the chat. What, what is the reason you got into the arts? If you could encapsulate this in one to three words. So this will be a little bit mysterious, right? But like in one to three words, why did you get into the arts? And, and then why do you stay? Why do you stay? Why? You know, like, isn't that the interesting thing? This is such a huge relationship being in this um, ecology and then set, trying to center ourselves or trying to center other artists. But my question to you, and you, if you've got paper next to you, you can do this, you can just write old school. Um, one to three words, what inspired you to get into this work? And maybe you have to remind yourself why, <laughs> and, um, or maybe it's obvious, but what was that spark? And why do you keep on? Why are you centering? Why are you continuing on in this work? So let's just take a moment. You can throw it up into the chat. You can be spontaneous. You don't have to overthink it. You can write it down on a piece of paper and just hold it up to your screen. So I'm just gonna give you one minute to respond. And I'm gonna read out some of the, Ooh, I love this. Okay. <sighs> my parents at three years old saw my potential and dragged me to a TV show in Jamaica. I'm still in the arts because life, breath is art. Art is dreaming with my eyes open, boundless, timeless communication, gathering connection, magic, beauty, inspiration to be challenged, to inspire and be inspired, the communal connection. Keeping on is a harder question. Curious to hear from folks about this. Ooh, I like that. Um, it is my way of knowing and it keeps me healthy. Community, magic, excitement. Okay, and this beautiful list goes on. At first, I just like the attention of being on stage, exactly, but now I just love being in the company of artists. I've always felt a pull towards the arts. To be changed, art is fundamental. I love this list. You might want to save it. It's <laughs> you, know, you can just like look at this back when you need a moment of inspiration. Why are we doing this? So this is what it feels like, you know, when we're talking about centering the artists and the ecology, how do we center more of this in this space? And I will leave that as our open-ended question as we move on to our first speaker. Thank you, Ella. Um... I wanted to make sure I was the one introducing Sanjay and um, Sally purposefully because there's a backstory to even Sanjay's contribution to Sapamo uh, in many ways when he worked for the Ontario Children Foundation and also that we were held sort of in the counts with Ontario Presents um, for the very beginning stages of, of our sort of organizational development. So that's actually a centering. And so I wanna just also throw that into the space and the ways in which we are here because he um, and others saw that potential. So Sanjay Shahini is an arts professional with 25 years experience in the field. Sanjay has worked with the Ontario Arts Council, Ontario Children Foundation and Canada Council for the Arts. He's the executive director of Edmonton Arts Council, EAC and has led the development of connections and exchanges, a 10 year plan to transform arts and heritage in Edmonton. Which, is, which was approved by Edmonton City Council in 2018. He currently serves as a member of the Board of Trustees at the National Arts Center. Um, Co-facilitating or partnering with um, Sanjay is Sally Kim. Sally has dedicated her career to building cultural capacity in Edmonton in her various roles at the Edmonton Arts Council. Sally has participated in and overseen the development and impl implementation of two separate 10 year cultural plans for Edmonton. And as Associate Exec Executive Director, she's currently leads the following areas of EAC, equity and inclusion, indigenous relations, partnerships, and human resources. Prior to her time at EAC, Sally worked to promote the festival city brand for Edmonton tourism, and was a producer and general manager at the Works Art and Design Festival. As an events coordinator at the Alberta Scene, at the National Arts Center and supported ancillary events for the Folk Life Festival at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Welcome Shahini and Sally. Sanjay, let's, let's begin by, if you could please share, you know, we asked everyone this question in the chat, but what was the thing that 
brought you into the arts that inspired you, what, regardless of whether you still apply it now and what keeps you in this work? You know, I remember, I think you were the first person I met who worked to the, the Trillium Foundation. I got to sit down with you and talk to you a gazillion years ago. Sorry, not that, not that long, I mean, um, but you know, a while ago. So what was that inspiration and what keeps you now? And then from there, uh, can you share a little bit about your thoughts around centering the artists in this work? Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, it's very basic, My the reason why, I, why I'm in this field. I was surrounded by it as a child, so I was quite lucky in my own family. Um, and it was both in terms of performance, but also um, in uh, the visual, uh, you know, visual sort of moving image arts, so film. Um, but the most basic, when I look back and I look and I think about it, it's not an intellectual reason at all. It's actually what made me feel old. It made me feel complete. And it's, it's that moment when you're in something where, you know, there is, um, you know, in, in sort of philosophical terms, in the Western canon of philosophy, uh, there, is a, there is a separation between mind and body. And, you know, that's just how it's evolved. But in India and in other parts of the world, including um, in, on this land, that kind of separation that actually exists. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that duality which has collapsed. You know, the, the heart and mind collapses because the whole person is able to experience something fairly deeply. So it's, it's actually a primordial thing. We're all born with it. And uh, so I never, I never lost, I never lost my, my, my uh, memory of that. It stayed with me, and, and I've come in and out of the arts uh, world, um, for, you know, right throughout my life. It's just that in the last 25 years, I've just been dedicated to making sure that artists actually have a role and a position in our society so that everybody can experience this. Thank you. And so what does that mean now? I mean, there's like a re there's a sense of of more urgency once again, you know, so why, why, why centering the artist? What does that mean to you and your work? How can this be, how can this be moved forward more effectively? Well, I think, I think because the, the idea, you know, the, it's both the reality and the idea of an artist, you know, there's the, the, the notion that, that individualism and not individualism as an ideology, but the individual, um, you know, is an individual because there is there is difference within. It. It's not something that you have to look for. And in our society today, with the domination, with the dominance of the digital world, and, and I'm just going to say that sort of you know market economy, there is a tendency to flatten everything out. Um, and that flattening out is, unless you're critical and you understand it. You begin to accept it and normalize it. So, for me, uh, not having not having a kind of uh, not having the kind of individuation and the variegated nature of thought, uh, creative action, and imagine, I think a very dangerous thing. It's one of the reasons why you know there have been such uh, massive assaults on on. Um, you know, in sort of democracies all over the world, where there are there are institutional and corporate forces that are um, that seem to not want this kind of individuation because it threatens the market. The market wants savings. The market wants commodities. The market wants you to desire something that you actually uh, don't you know can't even control. Right. So. They tell us how to feel, and they tell us how to how to approach the world. So that's what I want. And so within that, there's always that dynamic of, and yet when you're running a very administrative structure, an arts council funding, you know, I, I mean, I've worked at the Toronto Arts Foundation for quite a few years. There's this. It's a what's the word? Is it a paradox? Is it? A, I don't know, but that that um, 
how do we do that? How do we do that within these structures? How do we actually make that space? Like how, how in your mind can this be applied as, as someone who works within these spaces that can have, be quite linear and, and want to normalize a lot of um, this in order to, to put out funds, but at the same time, I guess it's taking away funds and opportunities from people as well unintentionally. Yeah, I think, you know, what we are trying that doing an experiment at the Edmonton Arts Council and actually in the city of Edmonton, uh, this organization, for some of you who may not know it, was, was created by artists and uh, it was driven by, by the community. And a very uh, interesting thing happened, you know, in, in the mid-90s, early 90s, when this was actually, this idea of having a council was, was created a uh, city council actually voted to divest itself of their own cultural department. So they wanted something that was driven by the community. And, you know, we've evolved with that ethic and with that, with those principles and values. The artist has always been at the center of the EAC. And so as we've grown and we've become more, um, more accountable for all the money that the city gives us, you know, we, like everybody else, developed structures that were transactional and that did, that actually came in between relationships. And the very creativity that artists have in the community, um, we had organizational structures and organizational uh, processes that actually blocked that. So at this point, with Connections and Exchanges, the new 10-year plan that we are implementing on behalf of the city, we have now revisited that. We've gone back to our original, to the origin of why, who we are and why we're created. And everything from our granting processes to our, you know, public art commissioning work, um, to our community work, to even through, to our, um, you know, we are an arts council that has a retail outlet. So we have a community box office. But we also sell the work of arts in Edmonton. All of those things are now being questioned and opened up. And we've developed a four-pronged approach to actually guiding our work, which we have shared publicly in our community. Um, the first part of this approach is that in order to get away from a transactional nature of application comes in, check goes out, um, we, have, we have said that we are committing, committing ourselves to listening and understanding, which means that There'll be formal consultations and roundtables and all of those things, but that we we will actually be out in the community, just spending time with artists, spending time with organizations, not checking their work and not actually doing it because it's a, it's a bureaucratic thing. So the listening and understanding piece is really important, mostly because we have a number of people in Edmonton who we don't know and they don't know us, and I'm referring to equity-seeking groups and I'm referring to indigenous artists and, and, and indigenous groups. And too, for, for far too long, there has been the center and periphery when it comes to these groups. And there's no reason, you know, we are, we are a publicly funded uh, organization and we are, we are driven by the community with a mandate. So the listening and understanding piece is something that is critical to us. We also want to collaborate. So the, uh, the value of collaboration as we talked about, it's a much used word, but what does it actually mean to collaborate? It means that you are, you're willing to actually suspend your power and not get into debates, but get into a dialogue. Because when you get into a dialogue, you're actually saying that you, you accept the other point of view. You're not coming to the table with, with a position saying that my position is better than yours. And so, so there's a shaping and, a, uh, shaping and advancing of the community with the community and for the community that we're actually trying to implement. Uh, there's, a third, there's a third approach, which is really all about um, giving, giving, uh, giving artists in the community and organizations in the community the ability to test and explore something, to seek and explore. And the Edmonton Arts Council, as it implements new programs and new services and new, new projects with the community, we want these to be experimental. We want these to be exploratory. We don't want these to be set in stone, um, which in, and things which are bureaucratic and don't change. And so we are committing to that. And then finally, once we have created um, 
you know, an, an environment where artists can actually see themselves and see their own work and see their own contribution to the city. Um, we want to create and show it to all Edmontonians. We want to celebrate it. We want to, to, to climb up a tree and shout about it. We want to be, we want the rest of the country to understand what an amazing scene we have here in Edmonton. Um, and we are a large city and, and artists live in large cities. Most artists live in large cities. And there's no reason why artists cannot actually connect with each other and exchange all the wonderful stuff that happens. Our, our country is big and sometimes that's used as an excuse to keep people apart. And sometimes it's used as a way to center power in, in a region. These are all bureaucratic constitutional things that have nothing to do with how people are living their lives. People are moving around, people are mixing, people are sharing, and we want to play a role in that. And so we were quite deliberate with connections and exchanges that you know the, the previous plan, which was also groundbreaking called The Art of Living, was really focused on the arts community itself. Um, but in this plan, it's what we're telling Edmontonians is this, that the arts community is not peripheral. The arts community is not a nice thing to have. The arts community is gonna lead you and lead our city uh, and create a, a new city building effort. So the whole point of all of this is to make sure that whatever the city does, it cannot ignore artists. And artists are going to be part of everything we do. And we're making good boxes. Thanks. Thank you, Sanjay. So perfect timing to open this up to uh, questions, comments, feedback. Um, and, and if there's an opportunity to, if it's a question, Sanjay will respond. If it's just feedback or sharing your thoughts, I'll, I'll read it off. Um, and, and if you really wanna ask the, the question orally, uh, by all means, you can use the hands up sign or you can physically put your hand up and we'll, we'll call out. Uh, any questions, feedback, thoughts before we move into our breakout rooms? Mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to know, Sanjay, is it possible to, to drop the last thing you mentioned um, is a plan that the Edmonton Arts Council has? Is it a public document that could be shared? Uh, yes, and I can find the link and put it in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Sid, I think Sid was like, yes, please do that. <laughs> Um, okay, sweet. So I, I think I'm not going to ask any questions because I got the chance to, to field some during your talk. Perhaps we can use this as an opportunity for a little more time in the breakout rooms. Um, Kevin, do you want to describe what's happening next? Sure. So um, Sanjay has left some really interesting thoughts. Uh, one of them I know I will take into the room I will facilitate is what could be involved in this idea of listening and understanding um, from the artist standpoint. Um, what we're going to do in the breakout rooms is that we're going to start having a conversation and generating ideas. What could be involved? What if Sanjay mentioned that you may not have heard before? And then as an artist or as an, um, someone working in the sector, what other bold, um, interesting things, thoughts, ideas that are coming up for you in the, in, in the breakout rooms and to amplify and to continue the conversation? Uh, Sanjay, I have a question. Um, as Julia is, uh, Julia, sorry, Victoria is finishing up the, the breakout rooms. What's involved for you in that listening and understanding from the artist standpoint? That is not bureaucratic. That's not about um, a process for funding or an application. What are some of the things that comes for you um, as, as, as a funder in those particular moments? Yeah, and I mean, I think one of the, one of the key principles, key values is that, you know, we are striving very hard in this organization um, to bring about this idea of inclusion, right? So how can we be very inclusive? And part of being inclusive means that you have to suspend your belief and listen. Um, and I think, you know, I, and I think Sally, Sally may, I think she's joined us. So uh, Sally does a lot of work um, and has done a lot of work over the years uh, with indigenous communities in Edmonton. And I think there are, there are perspectives from there that actually um, allow us to sit in a circle in a way that where determination of something, 
seizing something up and making a determination is not the goal. So an, an artist is like anybody else. There is, you know, people are growing and shifting and changing. And to bureaucratize somebody's creativity or somebody's point of view is really easy to do, but it's also very violent. It's not a very, it, it, it's, a, it's very much against a principle of inclusion, right? And so it's, it's being aware that um, people have very deep experiences that people have, people have amazing perspective. One cannot assume that something, something needs, you know, something can be slotted deeply. There's too much of a checklist mentality in the funding, funding world uh, that, that really destroys any kind of relationship. So it all comes back down to that. Right? It's that relational bit of living and relating, not actually, not actually being somebody else in your job and then going out of the street for PDFs. So it's something I have to remind. We, we're also asking um, the facilitators to just throw one thing back to everyone now that we're all back um, that is coming up from their conversation. And I think I'll, if I could start, just because I'm already talking, I'm going to stop. Is this idea of, for me, what was really interesting is this idea of having artists on the boards of funders or more organizations, um, whether beyond funding. And then also this, this idea of um, what, what does a hybridized application process look like? And I'll go to Fanny. So concisely to share back some of the things that we talked about, uh, we started with talking about the checklists and how it can be so reductive, but we also went into the conversation in how categories also may be enabling. So we come to this kind of creative knot, you know, this kind of creative tension that I think we will probably explore when we come back together as a group. Thank you, Bridget. And I just wanted to thank everyone in my room for sharing their thoughts and being present. Um, our conversations, again, focused on basic income and the discussion there, as well as an artist's livelihood and having livelihood be the focus as opposed to meritocracy. We had uh, a few funders in the room, which was great. So just to hear a bit more about how they're evolving some of their programs and looking at different mechanisms to move away from, I guess, a concept of grant and looking at support. So we got some great notes on the Jamboard and look forward to having those documented and shared in the future. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Charles. Yeah, we talked a lot about the relationship uh, and how uh, inhumane it seems to be because we seem to be moving more and more online, checklists, um, prescribed forms. Um, and both funders and artists and arts or, or administrators, because we do have some funders in the room as well, we're sort of talking about how to have more of a human relationship uh, where knowledge can be shared um, and also, you know, perspectives can be shared, um, which would increase understanding and so on. There were some comments around that arts councils are public bodies, and so they're tax based, and so there is a requirement, uh, one would think, to uh, be transparent and accountable. Um, because we are paying for it in essence um, as, um, as taxpayers, I suppose, most of us in this session. Thank you, and Julia. Uh, we talked about a lot of um, categorizing and fitting in and not fitting in and standing out as authentic art in, while trying to find place in the organizations to catch their eyes. And one of the thoughts on the jam board was uh, working for the mass culture you see the research needs to begin to generate data on the categories for stakeholders, such as policymakers, to understand the value. Um, and yeah, we're going to be continuing that. Thank you. And Ella, any final things that you've, because you've been going through all the rooms? I, I was just a little fly on the wall, kind of just seeing how folks were engaging and talking with each other. So. I, I was thinking also about this, this notion of relationship building. Um, and I was thinking about also my personal journey. When I look in the room, some of the faces, like actually Sue Ellen, Laurie, some folks, I'm like, oh my goodness, I recognize these people from when I was, you know, first putting myself out there as an artist or trying different initiatives. And um, 
and I see you as people who said yes, you know, and I know it's not you, I know how it works. And yet there is this community of when people stay, this relationship that we build over time, the ways in which we get to know each other through the work um, is incredibly valuable. And so even uh, Liz just popped off, but you know, I knew she was with Art Starts and is now at Trillium Foundation. And I realized that that time that we spend in the psychology also allows us a greater permission to, um, to shift it, to change it, to speak up. And there's more comfort there and the welcoming in. Like, unfortunately, a grant welcomes people in and it tells artists, it gives them a resounding yes. And that's a really, that's a lot to hold on your shoulders sometimes because you don't want people to feel that way. And yes, it has, because I was also thinking the last piece was just around you know, we, we can present really well in these moments, but we've also gone through a lot this, you know, this last year. Um, we're vulnerable beings. And often when you're bringing your art forward, there's so much vulnerability and personal stuff in there. So, so to have these relationships in this granting structure that can actually make space for that is also huge. Um, so those are my, my personal reflections as the fly on the wall. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Bridget. Great. And just cognizant of time, I'm just going to do a really quick intro. I'm so pleased that Sid Bob is here to join us. He works um, out of Nipissing First Nation, and I want to get to his thoughts right away. So his bio, which is impressive and incredible, will be in the chat. So Victoria, if you could paste that in. And Sid, I, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for having me. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, contribute in a meaningful way. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm originally from uh, Salish territory. My mom is uh, Lee Miracle uh, and uh, my mom's uh, pat uh, paternal side is uh, from Salate Tooth First Nation and that's uh, people of the inlet uh, right across the water from Vancouver and uh, salmon folks. Um, they say when the tide is out, the table is set. Uh, that hasn't been true in my lifetime, uh, but that uh, that's the story that I that I that I've stories I've heard from her that it was true in her lifetime. So, and my dad is uh, Ray Bob from uh, from uh, the Stalo from Seabird Island First Nation, and our family is not originally from there. Uh, on my dad's side, we're from uh, Canyon people. And uh, Stalo was uh, people of the river, so the salmon people. And um, but I, I kind of grew up here in Ontario. I'm in Nipissing First Nation. Um, that's arguable if I've grown up. But um, I uh, co-founded with a number of other folks, um, Onomatogse, and that's uh, uh, Nishnabimwin for he or she speaks. Um, and it's a kind of a an inter arts uh, company. We, we uh, I think we're kind of like, we were talking about identity earlier and um, we had this, uh, one of our founding members, uh, uh, Perry McLeod Sheb Gizek and his wife, uh, uh, Laurie McLeod Sheb Gizek were uh, talking about medicines in the area and they're uh, both fantastic uh, knowledge keepers. And they were talking about how plants uh, have all these different names. Uh, uh, based on the job that they're going to do. And so I thought, oh, that's kind of how I, I, I look at our company of folks um, and that um, uh, also for funding reasons, you know, we, we do a variety of work uh, up here, but uh, I guess, you know, we're, we're like those plants that we uh, have many names based on the jobs that we're going to do. And I guess the, uh, one of the things I wanted to, um, I, I was thinking about is that, um, uh, I find that, you know, we're, we're in a, in a, a big kind of, I feel like I'm in this uh, sea of transition and I imagine I'll be in a sea of transition for some time. Um, in that, uh, when I can't remember who asked was, oh, why did you get into the arts? And I, 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 I grew up in the arts, uh, and, and it's a kind of a funny word, but um, my mom's a writer. Um, my both my parents are kind of uh, in their early days are kind of activist folks, and uh, I got to hear my creation story. Uh, my dad told me um, 
when he was under the influence that I was made in China in 75. And uh, when I reflected my creation story back to him, he didn't remember. So, so I, I didn't, uh, he must have been uh, a, few, a few drinks in. And so I, I've heard my own creation story, <laughs> but um, I, I grew up in Vancouver and, and my, my parents are from this, uh, it was called the North American Red Power. It was kind of like a, a smaller version of what people might know as the American Indian movement. And uh, so uh, growing up with the, you know, the downtown east side there and, and uh, seeing that, you know, that to me is like a sea of depravity on Hastings, you know, where, where you see people, uh, um, you know, uh, living out of a cart and uh, uh, to me, like their spirits and bodies disheveled, you know. And I know, so I think that that's a kind of part of the transition that I feel like I'm in. And one of the stories that my dad was telling me, I, I, uh, I, we co-founded a studio, Big Medicine Studio with my, my um, colleague and wife, Penny Cucci. And I found out that my parents, their first apartment together was, was actually like a commercial space. And they would sleep in there at, at the sly of night. And it would be like an open door uh, space for people to come to and they would read france fanon wretched of the earth and they would teach people how to read who didn't know and kind of an activist milieu and um uh, one of the gather the first gatherings they had as a, as a kind of a, a young young uh, rebel group the indian affairs you know uh, came in to offer them funding and my dad's like you keep your you know your program pimp money to yourself we're we're uh we're in the middle of a revolution and so uh, when I heard that, you know, I was uh, working at the Friendship Center in Toronto on Spadina and it really kind of uh, yeah, struck me that, that, yeah, like the that whole sea of social uh, social funding in Toronto at the time, you know, uh, Native Child and Family Services and, and all that kind of stuff. I thought, oh, well, yeah, I'm, uh, in, in that sense, you know, I uh, am tied to that, you know, program money from the kind of settler state. And um uh, and this past year, uh, you know, can realize the vulnerability of being in that position um, of of being tied to kind of public sector funding. Um, uh, not necessarily a shameful thing on my end, uh, you know, so, some some parts and some reality, but um, I guess the scene of transition that I was thinking about is that, you know, here we operate um in a public sector kind of not-for-profit world but we also operate in a kind of what some people call like the tobacco economy and so down the road from me we have a wonderful man named uh, mike cucci who's uh you know he uh uh has a, a lodge down there uh sweat lodge is a conductor we have a, a lodge on our site but when i've asked him to carry out work you know often here we have a four-day fire so uh, when that's when someone passes on and uh my, her, my recently late aunt uh, carol carol uh guppy my my wife's uh, auntie carol ba she passed away a little over a month ago and so i asked uh, we asked him to to do a four-day fire in our tp on site so a 30-foot tp and um and uh you know he you know he always i hold my tobacco and make my request and he listens he doesn't touch it until until uh until he agrees to receive that so it's like a contract of sorts but i guess it partly relates to the listening and understanding that sanjay was talking about and um and then i uh you know i wanted to compensate him for his time which is what we do we exchange money in vancouver we have an old tradition of pinning money on each other compensating the person for the uh, time that they're away from their family and not producing. But he said, no, no, I just, just a tobacco because uh, he wants this to remain free. And so I thought, oh, well, that's accessibility, you know, that, and he said, you can't take away something that's uh, freely given. And so when I thought about my dad saying, oh yeah, you keep your, you know, program money to yourself that while well, there's, so then it, there's these different um, realms that I operate within here and uh and often uh operate in that kind of tobacco economy where things can remain accessible and and so that's been a 
that's something that I was uh, thinking about a lot this uh, past year is that as things shuttered, um, you know, from Nipissing First Nation to Nipissing First Nation's uh, health department, and then looking at ourselves, well, um, as these uh, as these uh, recommendations were coming down, um, it made it it, uh, it kind of brought about all these different sectors that and realms that we that I operate within, and that I guess relates to identity, you know, uh, and uh, so the this kind of uh, sea that I'm in of like different worlds um it's been uh, amplified this year in terms of um uh, what work needs to be done uh who has the uh capacity to respond um and here in nipissing first nation and i'm i imagine it's very similar to a lot of other places what's specific to 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 my community, I think, is that um, we're uh, being, being hit by this wave that I think was across the lake maybe earlier, which is like the, the opioid uh, 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 deaths. And it's just been astronomical, like just to me, it seems like where's the where's the flares, you know, where's where's the the Batman sign on the clouds, where's the, uh, you know, the sirens, because they don't seem to be, um, uh, uh, those things are not being uh, called out by our, our First Nations leadership. And uh, we're about 2000 members here, but just in Deshaney, we're maybe, we're uh, a little more than, we're probably a third of the, um, population of this reserve on reserve and it's just been uh, weekly numbers of a month like just young people um so that 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 that's kind of the reality that we've been in in this past year of just like yeah so many suicides so many uh deaths and so that's that's when i kind of as a as a not-for-profit organization within this kind of covid reality it's made me think about uh, the different identities that that uh, that uh, I that I carry because I operate in that kind of tobacco economy. I operate in a not for profit sector and sometimes uh, outside in the for profit uh, within the kind of uh, education system, working with the schools. Um, uh, so just to say one of the I guess the you know, the. Uh, in the last maybe 10 years or more and my my limited vision is that there's a, a great effort to bridge our um our old historic models of uh what is art and you know in in our here so many um people who make amazing drums are lodge carriers carry the stories our dancers are you know operate in those things maybe don't identify as you know professional artists and that's kind of a common conversation of you know i i imagine but um so i, I can see that a lot of work happening to bridge those realms and for us we're the first uh, i guess uh professional indigenous arts uh companies you know that have received operational funding here and that's only since 2010 so we're so new to this area that that reality is so new to this community and so we're always navigating the seas between um the work that needs to be done the work that we're inspired to do the work that we feel passionate or deem as necessary and then operating in all these different realms and um so i'm excited to see uh how things transform over the uh, the next uh number of years um, of course, uh, um, the art for my, I guess for myself personally is it, I, I fought to reconnect myself to the songs and dances. I don't have my name yet, but I'm going to, uh, that's my next thing of to, to go and get my own, uh, spirit name. I kind of rejected that early in my life because I felt too, uh, alienated, which is kind of, uh, similar to, you know, the residential school trajectory of my family, 
you know, the family violence or the, all those. So I feel like I'm, I'm uh, that kind of um, searching back for myself is also a part of what our company is, you know, in and out of these different realms. Mm -hmm. And I hope to see us all come together. But of course, that's uh, that's the that's the work of sovereignty. And, and of course, First Nations and the Indian Act and, you know, Bill C-31, where we are going to be legislated out of existence is a whole nother thing, right? You know, if I marry non-status two generations later, that's done. So that's going to be, you know, that's that's the future death of a lot of First Nations. But of course, I think uh, uh, the dream is bigger than uh, that, of course. And, and so we're a part of all these little narratives. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I feel like I went on a beautiful journey there. Um, and I, the thing that really stood out for me is the heart in, in everything that you do. There's so much heart and there's so much um, work, but it's, it's uh, um, I, the question, and I don't even know if it's necessarily a question. I, I wanted to flip it was, how do we, how do you care for you? Like, how do we care for the folks who are doing this work, right? Because it's, it sounds like you are, you're coming in with Big Medicine Studio addressing so many aspects that are both personal and community centered, also trying to reach folks and in, in ways that are um, in line with indigenous values, uh, where art is not always something that's, you know, pieced apart and defined in specific ways, but then there, and then there's the operating funds, um, the healing, and the fact that there is a lot on your shoulders, I imagine, in your community that is fulfilling, but also how do we, how, when centering the artists, how do we center the people running these programs and support them as well as my, my bigger, broader question? <laughs> I know we came to, to you to say, okay, what should be done? Um, but I'm also curious about how, what, what, what do you also need? Because you're at the center of so much of this. I guess uh, one the... Uh what we were told by a lot of people uh, this summer is to uh, is to make sure we're reaching out. So, uh, you know, we, I guess, you know, in terms of like our arts uh, models and structures, we're, we're, you know, we fall kind of along uh, community arts uh, models, like with Jumbly's Theater and, and, and other folks in that I find it's culturally relevant to say, well, how can we be inclusive? You know, how do we remove those barriers? And so I find community arts has done a lot of great work to uh, have uh, artists uh, centered realities. You know, how do you bring in the kids to to work? You know, of, of course, you know, when we're not paid, uh, when we don't necessarily, you know, like, of course, you know, we're probably similar to a lot of uh, uh, organizations in that, like, you know, there's not a lot of classical uh, indigenous arts companies like, you know, Stratford or Soul Pepper or whatnot. And that's, you know, a kind of colonial context. So part of that self-care for myself is to allow myself to be angry to say, what's the big picture? But then also like on the on a, uh, artist note is like, oh, like uh, I have to make sure that I reach out for the help that I need. And I'm thankful for that tobacco economy because um, otherwise when you're underfunded, you just don't have that. And so we tr we try to reciprocate uh, as much as we can in that model, um, but uh, I'm thankful that I could you know like I you know feel so lucky at this time because I know that as an indigenous uh, person uh, in this uh, throughout these kind of lockdowns that uh, they can't stop ceremony and they can't stop harvesting, right. and so in that way it's like oh uh, well you know I, I you know uh that's been kind of a at least something that's kept you know me from e either being arrested or uh <laughs> but that's you know because i that whole reality is just like uh it's uh, so far-fetched and unimaginable you know uh, this 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 past year but i i uh yeah so just reaching out for my own healing and, and that's kind of something that we struggle to try and give our artists is is uh, those pathways mm -hmm. but but i imagine for this country, like if my salmon are disappearing, how crazy is that? How uh, unfathomable, you know, to know that the bison are, have been wiped out, that 
wild Atlantic salmon and now the Pacific salmon never would have dream, uh, dreamed that in my lifetime, but it's, it's close. And it just seems like we're, you know, of course, going to this uh, approaching the event horizon and uh, it's inconsequential to Canada. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. And so I, I always find, oh, Trudeau has climate science and, and you know, uh, hesitancy and all these other things, but uh, yeah, my own self healing and and trying to uh, do what what what's necessary to provide that to the community. Great, thank and you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, are there folks out there who would like to? Oh, ask. Oh, there's a Holly has just shared a uh, response. Thank you. Um, and are there folks who have any questions for Sid? I'm, I'm also curious um, when you talk about needs of the youth, needs of artists, it, what can be done to also center indigenous artists um, better uh, as we, uh, you know, as we move forward into this, this changing landscape, this future? Uh, that's the question I'm throwing out there, but I'm also at, looking to see what, what folks are putting in the chat as well. Yeah, and Komen writes, Sid, sending you and Penny our love. Wonderful. And Holly is writing, thank you for sharing so deeply. You can read more there, especially to BIPOC artists and the communities from which they're based and or of history. It is a time for listening, asking versus deciding and telling. Um, yeah, and so as we listen, if there is any, if there's any question you want to throw to Sid, um, otherwise we will move um, to our next speaker, Patty. And I am going to also um, ask Vitaria to share the written biography in the chat so that we can uh, concentrate on, you know, the, the real life Patty who is here for us right now. She is the CEO of Calgary Arts Development and a veteran community and arts champion. Patty, I pass it over to you because I'm sure that you will weave, uh, you know, with your life and passion and work, you will tell us more about, um, you know, your, your centering, uh, your centering work. Uh, thank you very much, Fanny, and many thanks for the invitation to be with you today. Um, uh, there's sort of six things that I just want to try and raise and hope that we can talk more about in the conversations. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be brief uh, in raising these points. But in thinking about this, I wanted to start off by just saying that I believe this world needs artists now more than they ever have. Um, and so for me personally, um, just I, I want all of you to know that and also, you know, to think about during uh, at the end of the Spanish flu uh, uh, pandemic, it was the rise of the surrealist movement, the rise of the uh, art deco movement, art nouveau, and, and, and that influenced artists as well as the First World War. Um, so thinking about the rise of these movements and that artists were at the forefront, not the center, but at the forefront of a way in which the world began to see each other and to see the environment around them. Uh, and I think we live in a time like that again. So um, uh, you know, as I said in one of our breakout groups, uh, Sanjay raised, uh, or I think Ella asked a question of Sanjay about what, how do we, in this current system, find more ways to center artists. And I would argue, we will not do that. We need a new system, not only to center artists, but to address the issues that Sid raised around inequity, to address Me Too, to address Black Lives Matter, to address reconciliation. These things will not get addressed in this system that we're currently in. And there's no amount of change that you can do in the system that will do that. So logically, a new system is what we need. And as funders, that is something that I, that is my aspiration. That's my end point. Um, recognizing there will be iteration uh, uh, in that effort. Um, this, the other thing I wanted to note is um, in my home, uh, Mohinstis, which is Treaty 7 territory, it is the ancestral and current home of the Blackfoot people and the Blackfoot Confederacy. In Blackfoot, there is no word for artist. 
the words that happen in Blackfoot are about those who write, those who draw, those who move. So this notion of creation of expression and the people who do that is part of the life of the Blackfoot people. That's what I aspire to for the world in which we live today, for Canada, for Calgary, my home city, Mohinstis. So in saying that, um, uh, 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 at Calgary Arts Development, we've been trying to look at our work in the context of arts-led city building. So how do the arts and by inclusion artists help us create those communities and those cities that all citizens deserve, not some, which I would argue the current system favors. It favors some. Our systems are, are biased, they're discriminatory, they're colonial, they're racist, all of those things. Why would we want to try and work within that kind of system to achieve the things that we're all talking about today? Um, my, my aspiration in that regard for arts-led city building is for artists to be at the table. And not only the board table of arts organizations or arts funders, but at the tables of conversations about building our cities, building our communities, creating connections, addressing mental health, addressing the opioid crisis. Artists should be at those tables. That is how we will change the value proposition. So um, I, I aspire high. I, you know, the, a million years ago, there was a guy, Jim Collins, he's a business guy. You know, your big, hairy, audacious goal. My big, hairy, audacious goal is to not have artists at the center of an arts ecology, but to have artists in the center of our ecology period. That's what I aspire to and aim for. And so in our work, um, we have a 10-year strategy called Living a Creative Life, similar to Sanjay's, um, that that is how do we create the conditions where Calgarians can live their most creative lives, recognizing that artists practice creativity every single day. And creativity is something that like, you don't. if you lost the DNA lottery and didn't get that creativity gene, it, you practice it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And artists do that every day. That's why you are so good at telling our stories, at expression, at, at reflecting back, being mirrors to us. Um, so that's the heart of our strategy. And I'll put the link in there uh, after um, I finish my comments. Um, and so in that spirit, uh, in the time that I've been leading the organization, we have definitely shifted resources more to individual artists. It's not a big chunk. It's still a very small portion of our overall granting. But we have looked at artists in the way in which they undertake their practice. So we have things like the Artists as Changemaker program, which is a, a cohort of artists whose practice involves social change or social justice or some kind of commitment uh, in their own practice as they identify. So looking for ways, I think it was uh, Jean who said it uh, earlier in the chat, trying to acknowledge the, the, the edges the, uh, that artists walk on to hopefully convey, to open up and reveal something for all of us to appreciate and to learn from and to uh, be curious about. Um, uh, we're currently working on um, uh, a pro like what would be the equivalent of an operating grant for artists? What would that look like? How could we uh, structure it? Recognizing the distinctions, you know, um, Sid talked about being a not-for-profit, right? Well, I sh artists are not not for well, they kind of are because we make so much less money as artists, but because it's for-profit entrepreneurial, small business, what are we doing to create an, uh, an, an atmosphere that would be similar to what we do for organizations? Um, uh, during COVID, we, we raised more money or we worked with our partner, the Calgary Arts Foundation. They raised $400,000 for individual artists. 
um, because we knew we were taking care of the organizations. So how could we find other partners to leverage and to raise money for individuals? So finding those allies, those co-conspirators. Um, two more points, Ella, and then I'll, I'll uh, uh, be ready to, to answer any questions. Um, uh, and uh, artists operating, oh, and advocacy. Um, some of you may have been a part of uh, some other panels that Sanjay and I were a part of, but we submitted an op-ed piece with five other or three other cities around supporting the idea of a universal basic income guarantee. So as, as, as funders, how do we use our influence, our agency to change, fundamentally, transformationally change opportunities for artists? That's something we're using more of our voice for. And the last thing I wanted to do was just provide um, uh, kind of five quick things that I, I would invite people to think about doing. So how do we change, how do we create this new system? Um, first thing is uh, uh, that we, we aspire to create a new system, not change the one that exists. We might have to do incremental to get there, but aim for a different system. Uh, secondly, uh, yes, include individual artists as board members, but I have staff members who are artists and who undertake their artistic practice while they gain a salary from me as a funder. You know, the reality is a lot more influence as a staff member than as a board member around changing systems. Uh, so don't just think about those volunteer positions. Think about the paid positions inside organizations, inside funders. And even, uh, you know, how many artists all sit on advisory committees for free? They're gig workers. They need income, pay them pay them something, even if it's not very much, but pay them until we start developing this practice, this understanding for those who have, that you pay an artist for their time. Um, we need to do that and think of other places where they don't necessarily have to volunteer um, their, their lived experience, their expertise. Um, uh, next thing, uh, as organizations, as arts organizations, we could all afford, and I can include me as an arts funder in that, uh, we could all afford more humility, more empathy, more generosity. Um, it can't be about how do I help my organization survive all the time. If it is that all the time, then I would invite you to consider, is it really, an or is the structure you have as an organization, is your presence in the ecology really that worthwhile? It's a hard conversation to have, but we spend so much time talking about create new organizations. The system cannot afford an infinite number of organizations. So when, who, how do we decide when it's time to close? And we've actually introduced a granting program this year in the pandemic that does just that. We will support you as an organization if it's time to call it a day or it's time to merge or it's time to rethink your structure in a smaller, not bigger capacity. That's a granting program that we now offer multi-year. Um, and the final thing that I will say is that as individual artists, um, and I, I saw that Craig Bergold was on the call, you have the power of one to be the power of many. Universal basic income for artists is a game changer. It would transform and give us the catalyst we need to create new systems as funders. And it's a federal issue. So it's not about who's riding. A plethora of artists rising and sending a voice to the federal government to say, we need this and we want this would be very powerful. And I would really encourage all of you to look to those movements where you can lend your voice, where you can lend your creative spirit and talent to move us to make that change. Uh, thank you all very much. That's my final thought. I love it. I see Kevin snapping. I see hands. Beautiful. Um, thank you. I felt like you're real fire. You were igniting things in the way that you shared. Um, uh, Firestarter was the word in my head. Um, 
I, yeah, I, I, I really hope that folks took that into account. I, I saw some people really popping around. What, what does an operating grant look for, well, mean for artists? You know, what could that be? And I wanted to ask you a question a little bit as an S disturber. Um, you said that around artists need to be dedicated for social change and be able to like really define that. And I, I, as someone who is dedicated to arts for social change and, and it, that's inherent in my work, it's sometimes exhausting to always have to prove why this thing is going to make change. And I wonder, does it always have to be, even though it does, but does it always have to be in the artist to prove that in order to get money? Can it be the, something that the funders start to be able to define without the artist always, you know, cause like the aspect of art creation is that sometimes it isn't in it isn't in that clear space, it's in that creative flowing space. So when you describe it, can it also be something that funders are able to use their lens to define rather than leaving it on the artist to, to, to define? It's, my, it's a question. Yeah, a hundred percent, Alan. Sorry, in, in my effort to try and get through all my points, I didn't go deep in very many, but the, the program that we have it is a specific one. It's not the only one, but I, I just wanted to raise that. So we created the program believing in how art and social change come together. Mm -hmm. The artist role is to self-identify. If your practice involves social change in any way, then you are welcome to be a part of that cohort. Right. And um, because we can't have everybody who self-identifies, there's only uh, 10 at a time that we um, um, have in the program. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of ways artists articulate and use their practice. Mm -hmm. And so what we hope we're doing is creating a space where artists can do that. We, we partner with a Trico Change Maker Studio at Mount Royal University. So, it's been quite a, an extraordinary experience for us over the last three years. Thank you everyone for your time today, to our speakers, for your energy, to Kevin, to Charles, to all the folks at Sapamo, Victoria making this happening, Fanny, uh, Bridget, Aaron, thank you all. I'm oh, sorry, Aaron, I threw you in there because I came in and thought you were a facilitator at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> um, Kevin, what's next? Anything that you need to pass on to folks as they go? Just a thank you. We'll share this as in a document way, but we have a little bit more process to go. Um, we've been gathering information. Thank you for your offerings. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to the partners in art festivals and mass culture. Thank you to the Canada Arts Council, the Ontario Arts Council, um, for who has funded some of the work that we're doing uh, in partnership also with um, Art Festival and Mass Culture and also for Sapamo. You know, I encourage you to really go out there and decenter your experiences in the art and really think about the ways in which um, your art is political because the very act of your body, your beings in space is a political act given what we know about indigenous presence and bodies on this land. And to say that we will not challenge these things and it's hard to dismantle some of the things that like Patty's suggesting is to sit in our privilege. And we know that we've been sitting in our privilege for way too long. In that shift, in that change, we'll be arriving at what the ecology should mean for every single one of us. That is a hope, it's a dream. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to all the speakers and enjoy the rest of your week. It's a holiday, so enjoy the holiday. You too, Kevin, enjoy your holiday. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone, lovely to see you.